WLRN Video presents Welcome Denise Chayina to WLRN. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. My pleasure to be with you. Great. So um, as you know, the topic of our podcast this month, well, the month for the month of May. Actually, we are in May. Happy May Day. May. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is the situation going on with the Georgia Green Party and the Lavender Caucus? And so why don't we start off today by you with you telling our listeners about your participation in the Green Party. How long have you been a member of the Green Party? Why did you join the Green Party? And what kind of roles have you played in the Green Party? Sure, sure. Um, first of all, I live in Augusta, Georgia. So we're right there on the Savannah River. Um, when I um, became interested was especially when Ralph Nader was um, running. And I thought, oh my gosh, I finally have a candidate that I know and I admire, and I wanted to find out more about the Green Party because they were supporting Ralph, and um, that's when I became more more interested. So back in 2000, I was also so proud of the Green Party um, with the whole issue with Gore and um, uh, the Supreme Court pushing. The Greens were this independent voice saying, "Push, push, you know, count the votes. Uh, let's let's make this." Um, a, a fair and equitable process, democratic process. And I loved that they were standing up and doing that, even though, you know, we weren't, you know, it wasn't our, it wasn't necessarily that we had a dog in the fight, but we did in terms of democracy and, and really promoting and being a part of a participatory democracy. It was, um, it was just, uh, it, it was wonderful. It was energizing to hear that there was a group of people who truly were working uh, towards allowing more people to participate in this process. So, yes, I became active and I worked with different candidates. And of course, Mr. Nader, when he came to Georgia and visited us, and I began to meet more people in the party. And through that, uh, my understanding and commitment to the green values, I uh, became more active and was part of the, the uh, coordinating council committee. And um, on the national, soon after, I was involved in the Peace Caucus, um, Women's Caucus. Um, it might have been a year or so later, something that I went ahead and was doing work as a delegate on the National Green Party Affairs um, also, which is very interesting and um, uh, definitely a learning curve um, with that and all the conversations that happen on the national level. I felt like I was learning more about government on uh, the national level. And that was helping me with the work I was doing on the local level anyway. So um, yeah, for me in 2000, it was about finding a party that I thought had values that, that I shared and I could finally uh, feel a part of something um, that I could learn more about and be appreciated in my roles. So I was um, you know, able to take on those roles. Later on, I was also secretary of the party. And um, recently, more recently, I think this is my second time actually as serving as co-chair. Um, the other big thing for me about the Greens was the focus on diversity, accepting, embracing um, all kinds of folks who have felt left out of the conversation. And among those, of course, uh, one of the pillars of being feminism uh, was really, really interesting to me just because of my own experiences as a woman and, um, uh, you know, my, my desire to make it better for the next generations. Yeah. So I felt like I found a home. Yeah. yeah. Wasn't Winona LaDuke, Ralph Nader's running mate, one of the years yeah. that he ran? Yes. She He's was strong. What a wonderful lady. We had the pleasure of meeting her and um, hosting her in Atlanta at a a homeless facility that was serving, oh my God, just, just all kinds of folks for a very long time. Of course, a facility that was um, under, um, uh, under what I say, served in terms of um, monies being invested in providing better 
but there they were folks so we met we met her down at that center in atlanta and heard about the wonderful work that she'd been doing and her yeah i mean what kind of a candidate goes across the country and spends times in homeless shelters and basically conducts town hall meetings in that sort of environment that blew my mind i was so uh, impressed with her well, so uh, yes yeah do you remember which year that was um so date let's see because david cobb um also was um uh, you know i'm not certain i'm afraid I, to say because i might i think yeah. it was 2004 ralph nader ran again in 2004 and you know 2004 for us in georgia was a really a fantastic time because we had candidates that is actually probably our best year when we had candidates for ag department we had um oh my goodness governor we had a senatorial candidate we had a number of folks that were running i think it was lieutenant governor governor ag um yeah we had several folks in the senate and our senate um jeff oh goodness i'm forgetting his last name but anyway it was a very exciting time in georgia we had huge participation and um and and you know we were active at every every event i don't know if you're familiar with how difficult it is for ballot access in georgia but we were so excited back then because we had viable candidates people who put their heart and soul into their campaigns and we were at every event including uh pride which is a huge event for us in atlanta collecting signatures because to run um, in Georgia, generally most of the roles that you're running for, you'd have to collect more than 40,000 signatures of registered voters before we could even be on the ballot. So it was an energizing time to have people who were so passionate on the national level running as Greens, and that did trickle down and was uh, kind of a spoke for us um, to get people um really motivated so it was, it was very exciting very exciting yeah yeah i remember that year that winona LaDuke ran and it was very exciting on a national level too is she still a member of the green party yes yes i believe she is and she's still doing work i think she's sort of passing the torch in terms of um you know traveling across the country and that kind of thing but i believe she's doing a lot of work um in the west um but yes she's still active still very active so the green party is a third party in the united states and it's in, an international party right there are green right. parties in other countries as well um what very very exciting in that you know when we talk about the importance of the environmentalism and I think people are coming to understand it so much more now. Um, it was based on the principles of preservation of the earth and, and kindness and care to the earth. Um, and so there's some wonderful folks. I'm remembering um, this wonderful woman in um, Africa. Um, I believe her name is, I might be saying it incorrectly, but it's something like Watari Matai, who was um, an African woman who, won the um peace prize she was a green won the free peace prize and she did um for planting trees across africa you know so i yeah yeah it's an international party came, birthed from from those um origins um and i think now more than ever has a place has a place in, in our society where people are looking Look at the new Green Deal, the, the, the new deal, they call it, right, from back in, um, uh, you know, in um, the, um, I think, more the of the 50s, era. right? But when we picked up and, and created that new Green Deal, every part of environmental wisdom that you could imagine is a part of that document. And and many people are are attempting to um sort of uh you know take their piece of it and uh make it their own but it's um it's, were you uh, a, part it's a compliment of, to the green party were you a part of creating the green new deal document 
I personally uh, was not on a committee or anything. I think we've talked about and through our com our work with our our candidates um, about the issues and about what issues of the new green the, the green new deal affect us in Georgia. And so um, I've worked more on that terms in terms of Georgia for our with our uh, alongside our uh, candidates who are talking about things like. Um, you know, banning fracking as a dangerous procedure that they are doing in Georgia. That kind of snuck into Georgia. We didn't realize it. I didn't realize it until a couple of years ago. And the first time I ever heard about fracking was at a green convention. I believe it was in 2010 in Detroit. And some, some folks that were campaigning, a gal from New York, I wish I could remember her name, was talking about this process. And I thought, what is she talking about? And she was talking about how New York would almost could have had their waters contaminated had they not fought tooth and nail to prevent that fracturing process, uh, fracking for short, um, from happening. And it was incredible. And she was so knowledgeable and, and um, conveyed that message about something I knew nothing about. And I thought, you know, this is what parties should be about is sharing you know information disseminating it and then how do we put it in place how do we put um the viable candidates that we know could push this legislation forward and make it happen and um that's what she was doing in new york and as a result uh truly uh motivating folks it was a real grassroots effort but they did it. They did it. They educated enough people on the dangers, the possibility of contaminating their groundwater, drinking water for thousands of people. And um, and they, they got that they got that changed. So yeah, that's really uh, inspiring. But the Green Party of today in the year 2020 is not the same Green Party that it was in 2010. Can you talk a little bit about the fracturing? <laughs> inside of the Green Party recently because the Georgia Green Party decided to sign on to the Declaration for Women's Sex-Based Rights. Sure, sure. Like I said, you know, we should be educating ourselves about every issue that comes up. And um, we began looking at the issues surrounding um, women's rights, um, partly because this um, uh, proposal had come up regarding the Nordic model back in, I think it was 18 first, when it came up to the attention at the national uh, level of the Greens. So we were talking about, you know, what is that? And and it was talking about protecting women in terms of prostitution and human trafficking. And those issues were very much of interest to all of us, and especially because Atlanta is a hub for human trafficking. So we began to kind of delve in and look at that. And that whole question of, you know, sex workers and prostitution and, you know, what is that really? And um, who's really hurt by these by these types of activities? So we embraced the Nordic model, okay, which said we're going to punish the consumers. We're not going to punish the, the folks that are involved and in being exploited. We're going to punish the folks who are putting down the money and um, being and consuming services. So we agreed about that and we've talked about it and we were, you know, educating ourselves. And then that led us to some documents that were very uh, pivotal, I think, in the history of women's mm -hmm. rights more recently in that, I think it was like in um, uh, 1979 when women came, came together from about 140 different countries when under the auspices of the United Nations and sat and and discussed um, digested information, shared the most recent research, and came up with this the document, um, the Declaration on of uh, on Sex Based Rights. So we looked at that document and we looked at the the whole thing, and we were looking at you know the influences on the. Um, things that were happening for women and for children. And of course, you know, internationally we're aware of how bad things are in other countries for women. They're a lot worse. There's there's rampant use of rape as a war tool. There's rampant exploitation and um, slave trading and slave and labor. 
we have some of that to this degree here in this country, but it's so easy to look at other countries and say, oh yeah, you know, these terrible things are going on. But we were looking at this document in a in a more a local localized um, effort to see what sort of um, exploitation or discrimination was going on in our own country. And so when you start to look at this document in that way and you say, oh, these what's going on? Um, we began to see that for some reason, people were still not, I mean, we still don't have parity in terms of economics for women in the workplace. We still don't have um, the, uh, the um, opportunities that we would hope for all women. And so we looked at this document and um, it started to even point out some concerns about um, the in the areas of trans um, procedures, trans transitions for people who were children who were identified as having what they called a dysphoria, an identity with the gender, the opposite sex that they were born with. And um, in looking at that, I'm as a, I work with children, I'm um, a licensed physical therapist with kids. I've been very well. Um, I've been very well informed in terms of growth and development of children. And so, some of the things that I was looking at were what? How are we protecting? How are we protecting women? How are we protecting children? And I think as we saw these procedures that were happening and looking at what's the natural life process in terms of quote growth and development for us you, you want to protect children's rights to go through those processes and um, to be nurtured and supported in whatever aspect of perhaps there is um, if there is any um, medical diagnosis emotional or mental diagnosis to be supportive and preserve preserve the rights of those children. And so it was a little, um, it was unsettling to read this, the information about efforts that the, uh, and I guess in terms of groups, this, the trans lobby were pushing for um, children to go through procedures such as this puberty blockers, and then given these cross hormones early on in their development prior to going through puberty. So they were they were preventing them from going through a natural process. That just set up red flags to me. And um, I so I began looking at more information and, and others in our group have as well. And um, in finding that really, when you talk about best practices, we're seeing that uh, what that we call watchful waiting was really more of what was recommended. And total support of children and um, and to their parents. Okay, um, I can only imagine what that would be like to have a child identify as the opposite sex, and you know how do you do that nurturing and how do you what do you provide for that child to help them be comfortable? Um, but we have those services out there. We do have professionals, and everyone should be allotted that opportunity to have those services available to them. Um, going further, the, the um, trans lobby has seemed to want to infringe on the rights of women. And instead of defining or agreeing that women are defined as female by certain, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> um, particular um, distinct qualities, and some of those have to do with growth and development, having a um, having your period, being able to give birth to a child, going through menopause. Um, those are distinct biological uh, steps, stages that we go through. And so for some reason, there are folks that want to um, consider themselves in the same category as women and sort of erase those biological um, uh, markers as a difference. So, Let me interrupt yeah. 
let me just interrupt and say how anti-environmentalist and anti-nature that seems to me that stance it's like it's a, it's like a denial of nature and biological reality and if the green party is the environmentalist party how can they be going along with that you know you are listening to WLRN Denise you were talking about how you're looking forward to dialoguing with the people inside of the Green Party who believe in gender identity, that have an, an emotional attachment to gender identity, um, even though this concept basically erases biological sex. And you were saying earlier that biological sex is is important when you're talking about what it is to be a woman. We get our periods. We um, can give birth to children, we go through menopause, all of these things that are based in biology that that make women women and how gender identity just basically just erases that. And right. um, you were talking about how you are looking forward to dialoguing with the folks who do believe in gender identity in the Green Party. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, because I think they have, I think they're, uh, mixing up acceptance and love for them with um, a need that they have to make a declaration of their own about who they are. And I think every group, and, and we are a distinct group as women, um, that we should have our ability to, um, you know, be respected for who, for who we are. But you can't be expect to be respected for something you're not and so i think they're they're mixing up a message of people accept folks that are transitioning they um are accepted and there are other human rights condition uh article um documents that ensure that our friends that are trans transitioning or are already transitioned are entitled to the human rights they're entitled to. So it's not like anybody is um, negating um, who they are, but I think it sounds to me as if they're negating who women, biological women are. And I think that um, after we would both be able to sit down and hear the points of view, perhaps there's room um, to take away the, uh, the aggressiveness and the attacks that happened to us when we we simply signed on to an agreement which we felt protected women and protected children and it was misconstrued as some sort of a slight to in particular the latin i mean the um, lavender caucus uh which is made up of uh, gay lesbian um bisexual trans folks and um so i there was no insult there and so, you know, I think we would like to understand, or I would like to understand why um, an insult was, was perceived. Mm -hmm. um, do you, so think, I, I, do you think yeah. that maybe the reason why an insult was perceived is because trans ideology is misogynistic? It's hateful towards women. I mean, the reason they got so upset with you is because they don't really believe in women's rights. They, they don't think of women as a distinct category. They think of womanhood as something to be colonized, basically, you know, that men can colonize women, womanhood and be even better women than we are. Well, and so isn't that why we should call them out? We, to call them out on exactly, Absolutely. you know, tell us what it is exactly that you don't agree with. Um, and then um, you know, acknowledge who you really are. Um, it seems to me that when you resent, and, and this was one of the issues, uh, the more we were educating ourselves about the detransitioners, the folks who were, who were being um, encouraged to go through a transition, but who um, years later said, no, that's really not what I wanted. And I was encouraged by people who uh, thought they knew better than I knew about myself. And so it's really disconcerting to see people 
you know, coming out on the other end of that. Um, and the fact that these decisions are being made and uh, for children who cannot consent themselves to many of the procedures, I mean, these, these blockers and the hormones are causing sterility. Do we have, does someone have a right to do that to a child no. or shouldn't we child abuse. err on the side of watchful waiting and allow a child to grow into maturity, maturity psychologically and physically in order to make decisions, better decisions, right. you know, down the road. No, so I, I agree with you 100%. I mean, we, we here at WLRN <laughs> view it as a, uh, a social contagion and a cult, transgenderism, and the fact that it's like entered into even the environmental movement and the anti-war movement. And, you know, it's really centered, this politics, trans politics has centered itself in every leftist cause that you can think of. And I mean, it's just basically, it's narcissism at its core. That's our opinion here at WLRN. Mm -hmm. um, but I understand that that it can be a tactic to try to to open up a place to have a real dialogue. But to just be completely honest, I don't think they're capable of having a, a real dialogue, nor do they want a real dialogue. Um, basically, they called for your expulsion from the Green Party. Right. And completely so over the top, completely over the right. top reaction. Yeah. And they got other state Green Parties to publicly denounce the Georgia State Green Party and call for its expulsion. Now, who has the power and authority to expel the Georgia Green Party from the National Green Party? I, you know, I think that they would have to um, uh, take some sort of vote. Um, but the truth is that it's so ridiculous it, the attacks have been so um, uh, just violent, and you know when you when you go as far as making sure that somebody's uh, media po media blog is shut down because you don't like what they're that's so anti green that is so anti democratic that is so anti um, uh, First Amendment rights of freedom of speech that these folks to me are infiltrating. They are trying to divide um, and conquer the left um, with the ideology. And I think, I'm, I guess I'm hoping that the more, when I say dialogue, I'm hoping the followers will start to go, what? Really? Oh, well, then I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to follow. I'm not going to write a check for these people. And, and speaking of money, you know, it's interesting that uh, looking at following the money for some of these procedures and all seems to be um, that this is on the right, that the right and money, when you're looking at money, it's uh, coming from the right to support these efforts for these procedures and all. So it's the, I think there's a lot we don't know, but what we do know, we need to, we need to say out loud. And I think the conversation has been forced now because um, at this point, um, we're discussing having forums, but having, let's bring in, I mean, I'm, I'm one person and I'm not a researcher in the field specifically. So let's listen to what the experts are saying and let's put that information out there for more and more people. And I think when you look at that and we look at what we did to educate ourselves before we signed on to the agreement, we looked at a lot of different studies and, and things that were going on across the world um, not just here in our own little backyards, and it all, you know, it all says, be careful, be vigilant, support children that are, are um, have dysphoria, give them the supports to them and to their families that they need, but let's not jump to, um, you know, uh, that if you have transitioned to a female, that you now demand um, all the rights and privileges. And some of those were very hard fought um, for years uh, in terms of um, some of the set-asides that we, that we look at for um, even the affirmative action areas that we're still not in parity with. Um, I just now, just this week in our city, 
the head of the compliance department is is going to file a suit of discrimination because she as a woman was being offered twenty thousand dollars less than what all these other people in the departments and compliance over the city of augusta and i give her such full credit i just sent her an email and want how do we support you because they thought they could get away with that now this woman happens to be a woman of color she happens to be an attorney also by trade and i think she knows what to do but how many of us over the years have been marginalized because we were female passed over because we didn't we didn't get that uh promotion um i think you know i have my own stories and and i think people have theirs but this is why there's a difference in being a female a biological female we've been through different experiences and there's no i don't know why we would tolerate um being considered the same can i respect someone else for who they are absolutely but I don't think I'm going to surrender my rights to them just because they say so. Yeah. Good, good for you. We're mm -hmm. so grateful to the Georgia Green Party that you've taken this stand and that you're fighting this fight. You're the only party in the United States that is doing that, that I know of. I know the Democrats um, are all on board with the trans cult and it seems like a lot of Republicans don't pay that much attention to it or you know i don't know i guess there are some republicans that are against uh transitioning children but really a leftist party like the green party you, you're the only ones that are taking this stand how many members of the georgia green party are there in your state you know um the last time when the database, and I have to say, we've had our share of being um, hacked <laughs> and um, had to rebuild websites and, and databases and stuff. I believe at, at, at our height, we had like 500 people on the list. Um, I know that we would like to, and, and this is one of the things I'm hopeful for as more people become aware of what the Green Party wants to do and is doing in Georgia. Uh, coming on board that we can, um, you know, increase those numbers because certainly when we're looking at campaigns and ballot access, we need lots and lots of folks to join us um, to be candidates and to be uh, worker bees, frankly. Um, but I'm the I'm not sure of the current, to be honest, of the current database because, like I said, we've had we've had some um, invading. Uh, um, hacking going on and so I'm not I'm not honestly sure of what's intact um, but <clears throat> we're looking forward to um, another convention meeting coming up and uh, that'll, we're looking be forward online, to more right? people. that'll be online because of the virus outbreak yes exactly yeah this will be a unique opportunity uh, June 6th we'll be uh, gathering in the cloud somewhere and um, Yes, we will be there supporting candidates. And this is the Georgia Green Party that's going to be gathering. Say that again. I'm sorry. This is anyone who's a member of the Georgia Green Party is invited to this convention. Yes, yes, and um, and that reminds me. Actually, we we've, we've had in the past. Um, you know, really, if you're in in uh, if you believe and committed to the ten creek the ten key values and you want to work with us in Georgia, we want you. Um, we are asking folks to be dues paying members now because the reality is you just can't get things done if we don't have some money in the bank. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, we welcome folks from all over Georgia to join us. We'll be publishing a, um, an announcement for that actually coming up, I believe, Monday. Um, we'll probably launch that information. I read, I read in the Georgia Green Party statement that was made on April 7th that signing the declaration was unanimous, that, that nobody objected to signing the declaration. Did you, those of you who made that decision, how many people made that decision, number one? And then right. secondly, um, did, did that body that made that decision anticipate backlash um so we had been talking about uh, so prior to a meeting 
usually the coordinating council will be discussing issues prior to. It's not like we just come to the convention, although you can. Someone can come with a proposal on the day of the convention and you can hash it out and, and do a vote. We didn't do that. We don't do that. We usually mull things over. And so in our mulling, I think it was back in October, maybe, at a meeting, we did have a member who said um, that he was not you know, comfortable with it. And we asked more for more information. We're like, okay, well, like, what are you thinking? And um, he didn't really, he wasn't really forthcoming with, with information about what he thought was wrong with it. He just said, I feel like I'll abstain. And um, so there was one member that did that. At the convention itself, there were, um, I believe, voting members, there were nine. Um, we are a small little ragtag group, um, and so I believe it was nine members that were there. We had some guests. In fact, we had Dario Hunter, one of the camp, one of the folks running for president in the Green Party, was a guest at that meeting. Um, and then we had uh, the other folks. We brought them in on on the and phone. Dario, so, Hunter did, Dario Hunter did not object to you signing on to the declaration, but since you did sign on, he has come out publicly condemning you and asking the Green Party to expel you from the National Green Party. What do you think of that? Yeah, you know, it sounds, um, I mean, if he had an objection, that would have been the place to do it. And certainly as a candidate, we would have, um, he, he would have had the floor. He had the floor for, I forget how long we gave everyone equal time to present themselves as candidates. But he certainly um, had an opportunity. And it was, uh, you know, I, I don't know why he didn't say that. I can't speak to why he didn't make a comment. Um, it seems disingenuous because, you know, it's kind of like you, you were there and then you leave and you complain about that there weren't enough olives in your martini, you know. That's why didn't you say something when you were there? Uh, so I don't know. I don't know. Since then, uh, Dario and the Lavender Caucus had invited us to a quote a, a retreat, um, and unfortunately, the tone of that invitation sounded more like uh, you know to slap somebody's hands and be um, kind of a retraining. It was, and they were insisting that we take back. Educate you yeah. on they they want to educate you on the ills of your ways and have you basically say you're sorry. This is this is how the, the, these people function. They want you to publicly apologize, and sometimes enough pressure is applied that people do retract their statements and they apologize. I really hope the Georgia Green Party does not do that, that you stand strong. And that brings me to my final question that I have for you today, Denise. How can feminists and feminist organizations support the Georgia Green Party? Well, I'll tell you, first of all, your show's great. So I hope um, getting the news out, whether it's radio or it's articles in the newspaper, I would say the women who have especially some background in these issues would share the views, get more of this information out to the general public, because I think sometimes um, under the guise of diversity and acceptance, people are going to lend an ear to a minority group. Um, but acceptance and diversity are very different from looking at uh, discriminating and um, trying to erase the rights of another group. So we've got to help the public get the information, the current information. And so I hope for more opportunities like forums, like discussions, online discussions on the topics where, where experts come together. I've uh, listened to quite a few. One was in the UK, one was in Australia. Had an opportunity to hear people, and it's like, yes, we, we there must be more um, research, and we've got to get that research out to folks. So whatever, um, whatever you're able to do, whatever all of us are able to do, let's write some um, op eds and uh, you know letters to the editor and spur the conversation on more. I, I think that's the only way. We just have to uncover 
really what the information, what are people really trying to do and, um, and support the people who need to be supported, but certainly not allow people to silence us for uh, standing up for, for rights that have been hard fought for and will not be surrendered. Okay. Thank you so much, Denise Traina from the Georgia Green Party. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, Thistle. Thanks very much. Thank you for the support.